Good morning, everyone. We'll start uh, today with an update from our Commissioner of Health, Dr. Levine. Good morning, all. I'd like to start with a quick update and then a couple comments on two topics. The uh, senior living facilities and masks. Yesterday's labs brought 51 new positive results out of uh, approximately 470 labs, bringing our state total closer to 400. It's 389. There were no deaths yesterday. And we continue to uh, be actively uh, working with eight different facilities around the state. And if the experience of other states could serve as an example, um, that number will unfortunately grow. I wanted to say a few things about our long-term care and senior living facilities. They present special and high priority challenges. As you know, these are group settings they provide housing and care for Vermonters who are most uniquely at high risk of serious illness and even death from COVID-19. The staff and caregivers in long-term care facilities really depend on our response and our support, both immediately and in the long term. At the Health Department, our Health Care Infection Prevention and Response Team is our first responder unit. Outbreak prevention and response starts with primary prevention, including working with facilities to provide intensive infection prevention planning and messaging before any illness occurs. This work is happening now with every long-term care facility in the state, and it has been ongoing for weeks, if not months. Our team works with facilities to identify illnesses in vulnerable settings, then moves on to rapid response when a COVID-19 positive case is identified. The response clock starts the moment we receive information about possible exposure to patients, residents, or staff at these facilities. Specimen testing is prioritized and turned around quickly in our laboratory. The team is in constant communication with each facility and is available around the clock. When facilities request or we see a need for additional personal protective equipment, PPE, the state provides it. And indeed, in our most recent facility, Birchwood, that happened rapidly and successively over several days. The team works with the facility to evaluate the exposure risk of facility patients, residents, and staff, and begin our contact tracing efforts. The team helps the facility determine the best way to prevent spread. That may mean testing everyone, checking temperatures of staff, changing how the facility is delivering meals, or cohorting the residents. They also evaluate the facility to identify what additional supplies may be needed. Our public health response happens quickly. We know that lives are at stake. All of this is done in communication with other teams at the State Emergency Operations Center and Health Operations Centers to ensure that the response is coordinated, such as people needing to be in isolation or quarantine situations. The state's action with senior living facilities are coordinated through the essential services rapid response teams. So this is just what it sounds like. Rapid response planning and intervention to ensure those vulnerable members of our communities, especially those in quarantine, have the supplies they need and that their basic needs are met. My final comment is just going to be about uh, masks because anyone who's been paying attention to the news in the last 24 to 48 hours has heard the topic repetitively. 
at this moment in time, at 11 o'clock in the morning on this date, CDC and health departments, Vermont included, have been advising people who do not have symptoms of the coronavirus to not wear masks when out in public, saying that they offered little or no protection to the public. But in the past 24 hours, that advice is evolving, even though the definitive advice has not yet come from CDC or other organizations. And it's evolving fast, like everything else in the coronavirus epidemic. So now I am joining other health leaders in recommending that Vermonters wear cloth face masks in public, even if they have no symptoms. Now we know from more recent data that pre-symptomatic spread of COVID is possible, especially in the 48 hours prior to symptom onset. So wearing a face mask may help people from spreading the virus. I fully expect that CDC will be formally making the same recommendation today or in the coming days. But I want to stress two important points. We must still reserve medical grade masks for healthcare workers who are on the front line with patients. And secondly, social distancing, the stay at home, stay safe order of the governor is still the most effective way to slow the spread. So what Vermonters are already doing, the sacrifices they've been making with social distancing is beginning to show promising results in slowing the spread. But we still must keep up this good work for a little while longer, even as we see the curve of illness in Vermont potentially flattening, so that in the future, we can get together again in health and safety. Thank you. I want to take some time uh, today to recap some important information and requests we put out this week. First, my team presented our modeling and projections yesterday, as you all know, which is data that we use to guide our decisions and plan our response. It's important to know that with uh, while recent trends have given us some hope, we know this can easily change day to day. For instance, today we saw a significant increase in positive cases, well above what we've experienced in the last few days. So while I want everyone to stick together and remain optimistic, we have to be realistic as well. We're going to see ups and downs. We're going to see outbreaks and my team will continue working hard to adapt as we've done with our rapid response teams to address these challenges in order to keep Vermonters safe. And we can't take our foot off the gas. Social distancing and washing your hands continue to be the most effective tools we have to reduce the spread and make sure we don't overwhelm our hospitals. As Dr. Levine said, we're also hearing a lot about wearing masks. But I want to be clear, this is not a substitute for staying home. And it is not an excuse to mingle with others. Please continue to follow the measures we put into place, even if you're wearing a mask. As I've said many times, public safety is a top priority of any government. And that's what I've had in mind as I've made decisions during this pandemic. In order to save lives, we've taken many aggressive steps to slow the spread of COVID-19, flatten the curve, and keep as many as our, our friends, family, and neighbors healthy as is possible. But again, I know this has caused a lot of economic uncertainty and put a strain on many families and businesses. We basically had to shut down our economy in order to save lives, and I know how hard this has been. So I wanted to take a few minutes today to remind you of the resources available due to actions on the state and federal level. First, as a result of the CARES Act passed by Congress, most will receive a one-time check of $1,200. And if you filed taxes last year, you don't have to do anything. The money will either be deposited into your bank account later this month, or a check will be sent in the mail. Second, we've expanded 
unemployment eligibility and waive many requirements. For the first time, you can file uh, for these benefits online, and there will be an additional $600 added each week. Third, support will also be available to self-employed Vermonters and independent contractors, although we're still awaiting guidance from the feds, but we expect to see that soon. There are also programs available to help businesses get through this. This includes the Paycheck Protection Program, which is an incentive to keep workers on your payroll. It provides loans through your banks and, and credit unions to cover these expenses. And if employees are, are kept on for eight weeks, up to 100% of the loan is forgiven. This program is open today, so please visit sba.gov slash paycheck protection to learn more. Small business owners are also eligible to apply for a disaster loan, and you can receive a grant for up to $10,000, which will not need to be repaid. This is also available to self-employed individuals, and the turnaround time is just a few days. These are just a handful of what's available, and you can find all this information at accd.vermont.gov. While we know there is much more to do, and we'll continue to focus on economic relief as part of our response to this pandemic, it's important to use the resources that I described to help get through this. Earlier this week, I also called on Vermonters to support our COVID-19 response. Even before this crisis, Vermont faced a workforce shortage across all sectors, but especially in healthcare. With all the hours these workers on the front lines are putting in, and knowing some will become ill, we need to build our reserves. So we're asking those with medical experience to volunteer for our Medical Reserve Corps. If you have this experience, please visit vermont.gov slash volunteer. Others are maybe looking for ways to help as well and can find additional volunteer opportunities on this website. While we're asking a lot of people, we also want you to take care of yourselves. It's so important for everyone to continue to stay home to save lives. But this doesn't mean you can't get outdoors and enjoy some fresh air. In fact, being outdoors has probably never been more important. Exercise, fresh air, and nature can help, help us manage the stress and uncertainty that we're experiencing. However, we've got to be smart about where and how we get outdoors. So I'm pleased to have Secretary Moore here to talk uh, a little bit about what you can do and what you can do safely. Julie? Thank you, Governor. Uh, as you indicated, it's never been more important for Vermonters to get outside, but also to stay close to home. Um, and we need to choose smart ways when we're thinking about outdoor recreation. Nature can and is helping maintain our physical, mental, and even spiritual well-being. Exercise, a sense of normalcy, and the beauty of Vermont as we transition into spring. However, we have to be thoughtful about all of this. Under normal circumstances, I'd be the first person to encourage everyone to discover all that our state, and in particular our state parks and state lands, have to offer in terms of outdoor recreation opportunities. But in these unprecedented times, it's important to be smart about if and how far you travel for time spent outside. With gorgeous spring weather forecast for tomorrow, anyone planning to spend time outdoors this weekend should do the following. First, stay close to home. We're fortunate to live in a place that has outstanding outdoor recreation and nature, and much of it within walking distance. Now's not the time to explore far-flung far corners of Vermont, but rather to focus on backyard adventures. Spend time in places that you can walk or bike to, and if you must drive to get outside, work to limit your trips to less than 10 miles. Be sure to continue to observe social distancing outdoors. If you arrive at a crowded trailhead or a place with an unmanageable parking situation, see that as a sign. Please turn around and choose an alternative that's not as crowded. And also, it's important to leash your dogs. They're members of our households as well and need to keep their social distance. When choosing a recreation opportunity, skip the risk. When you're outside, engage in low-risk activities. 
be smart and cautious to avoid any incidents that could require medical attention. If you have an accident, you're putting health care providers and emergency responders in danger. Their sole focus should be on combating the COVID-19 crisis, and we can't afford to have them called to respond to other emergencies, especially those that could have been prevented. And please, respect the signs and respect the land. Stay off trails that are closed. They've been closed for a reason, whether it's for mud season, um, because they've been overused and are at risk of being irreparably damaged, or because they require maintenance to allow safe passage. For areas that remain open, we ask that you practice leave no trace principles, and if you brought it with you, bring it out with you. There's current information on the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation website about the status of trails, um, and we're pulling in information from our partner groups, including the Green Mountain Club, Vast and Vasa, the Catamount Trail, Vermont Huts, and the Vermont Mountain Bike Association and Kingdom Trails, as well as land conservation organizations. And if you are interested in supporting our local outdoor gear stores, please do so, but do it online. We all love our gear shops, and we know that they're the lifeblood of Vermont's outdoor recreation at the community level. Without them, the outdoors and our lives as lovers of the outdoors would be vastly different. So continue to support your favorite outdoor retailer, campground, tackle, or bike shop, but please do so by visiting their online store. In sum, as the weather warms, as soon as tomorrow, uh, the pull to be outside for many of us, myself included, will be incredibly strong. And the restorative powers of being outside and being able to make a little vitamin D is more important than ever. With a bit of consideration and planning, we can keep nature close, keep our parks and our trails open, and keep ourselves and our families and our communities safe, all by recreating close to home. Thank you. We'll now open up to uh, questions. All right, thank you everybody. We're gonna follow the same path we did on Wednesday. Please know you're muted by our system. You'll need to hit star six to unmute. If you've also muted your own device, keep that in mind and unmute manually from that. I'm gonna, uh, we'll be allowing for follow-ups for clarity. You don't need to wait for me to prompt you. Uh, just go ahead after the answer is finished. Um, but please keep in mind, we do also again today have a long queue and just need to get through this um, and get these folks on the stage back to work. Uh, we'll start in the room with Stuart. Oh. <laughs> uh, could, Dr. Levine, could we ask you about the UVM Medical Center uh, capacity? Is the, does Birchwood threaten that? Do some of these senior care facilities now threaten that? We understand yesterday that hospital census is very low uh, and they have a lot of, of capacity. So you're worried about uh, <clears throat> ill Birchwood residents taking up hospital beds? Well, I'm wondering, is that a concern of yours? Yeah. Um, at this point in time, for the reasons you actually stated, uh, not a concern. Also, I'm not aware of a high percentage of the Birchwood residents requiring hospital care. Of course, that can change on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, many of the residents at Birchwood were in the uh, rehabilitation portion of the facility. Um, which makes them, if I could put it in a little bit of quotes, uh, a healthier uh, facility population. Um, so at this point in time, not as concerned. Calvin? Um, at UVM, we're hearing from medical workers that are concerned about potentially bringing home the virus to their families. Some are uh, raising questions of maybe they could stay in the dorms at UVM. I guess, have, have you guys had any uh, discussions with the trustee? I don't know if you're on it, actually. So I guess sort of, has that been on the table? Um, I have not had any uh, any conversations uh, with uh, uh, Suresh Garamella uh, or anybody from UVM at this point in time, uh, but I know that they're a, a community, a part of the community, and I'm sure that they'd be willing to help in any way they possibly can, but, I, but I'm not aware of any of those conversations. Dr. Levine, are you? Not either. Greg from the County Courier. Do you have a um, I'll skip now. Okay. Anybody else in the room? Um, there was some discussion in the briefing yesterday. Uh, Commissioner Sherling discussed a bit about the state's request from the federal government for ventilators and PPE. And I just had a couple follow up questions. I was curious if you could specify the percentage of the state's requests from the federal government that have been fulfilled, and then how the state is prioritizing how that equipment is distributed among hospitals, nursing homes, and EMS. 
I'm hoping that Commissioner Sherling is on the line. Are you on the line, Commissioner? Maybe we can come back to that. Sure. Uh, we can try and get a hold of Commissioner Sherling to see if you call in because he would have the answer to that. Thank I don't want to give you anything that's uh, incorrect. We'll try to get him on the line. Sure. Anybody else in the room? Okay. Uh, we're going to go to the phone now, beginning with Neil Allen from the Vermont Standard. Neil, Vermont Standard, star six to unmute. <coughs> All right, we're going to move to Mike Donahue Vermont, uh, for the Islander. Star six to unmute. Thank you. Thank you, Governor. Um, we've been told Vermont cases are still projected to be uh, a month away before they're maxing out. And I'm wondering uh, what are the next uh, well, three or four possible directives that you have uh, in your game plan to try to beat this virus and to try to get everybody to come into compliance and defeat uh, COVID-19. Yeah, uh, again, our hope is uh, that uh, what we're trying to, to do today uh, to socially distance ourselves, uh, trying to put measures into place uh, to prevent people from uh, congregating and in different uh, places like uh, the, the um, directive yesterday or the day before uh, about uh, some of the uh, bigger facilities, the big box stores, uh, and trying to encourage them to do something online, curbside service and so forth, and just get the essentials uh, in, uh, in their stores to prevent people from going on uh, family outings and just shopping uh, trips in some respects. Um, so we'll continue to monitor uh, making sure that we're enforcing some of the actions that we have uh, and encouraging and educating uh, the actions we've already put into place. Uh, but, um, but at this point in time, uh, we have some in the queue, uh, but, uh, but at this point, um, I, I would rather uh, continue to do what we've, we've been doing because as, uh, as we noted yesterday in, in the briefing, um, uh, Commissioner Pichak had, uh, had, uh, had shown in the graphing, we're moving in the right direction. Uh, and the mitigation efforts are having a, a, a beneficial response. Uh, so uh, we want to continue uh, down that path. But, but some people clearly are not getting your message or they're ignoring it. And I guess I'm wondering if you're ready to go into uh, Governor Charlie Baker mode and go to China or wherever to make sure people on the front line have uh, what they need, uh, like admission staff at hospitals, janitors, and making sure people, uh, you know, stay in when they shouldn't be driving around or just going out to get cigarettes or something. Yeah, again, we're trying to educate as much as possible and direct uh, them to do the, uh, the right thing. Um, but, uh, but as far as the PPEs and so forth, uh, we're constantly uh, trying to make sure that we're fulfilling our inventory and getting those to people uh, who are on the front lines, and that includes the custodial staff and so forth. So uh, we'll continue to do that. We're having some success, uh, and uh, so that's encouraging. Uh, many people are working on this. I am as well, and we'll, uh, we're, we're finding opportunities every day, uh, and we, we continue to, to work on those to make sure that we have the equipment available uh, when and if uh, this, uh, this increases, which we know it's going to increase, but Again, our, our whole goal here is to not exceed the, uh, the, the line, uh, the capacity of our healthcare system. Uh, that uh, continues to be our goal, and uh, that's why we've taken a lot of the actions that we've, we've taken thus far. Thank you. Ann Wallace Allen, BT Digger. Ann BT Digger. Hi. Sorry, Ann Wallace. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Um, this is a question for the, I, I guess for the governor. Um, there still continues to be so much uncertainty and confusion about who should be wearing what kind of mask when in the public, not for health providers, but for people. Um, do you think it's appropriate for the state of Vermont just to issue some kind of guidance for Vermonters about masks? Uh, again, given the fact that. Um, 
Right. I'll let. It's uh, not happening. From. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I'll let Dr. Levine answer that. <clears throat> So I think we shouldn't get too far ahead of the game in terms of awaiting uh, some of the federal guidance regarding this. Uh, but it's quite clear from what's already been stated today and uh, in Washington that it's really, I guess, the term facial covering uh, rather than using a mask. The president went as far as you know woolen scarves and things like that, which may be reasonable, uh, but may, may not be the most effective. Uh, but there are other cloth materials that can be used in lieu of an actual medical grade mask. And I think as the time evolves, we're going to find out um, how we can interpret what is thought to be most effective in the cloth facial covering category. And I know the governor has you know, been very interested in enlisting the aid of numerous uh, companies across the state who actually have even asked questions about what they could do. And once we get this more direct and specific guidance, I think it will be easier for people to either go into their own closets and drawers or for us to give guidance to uh, organizations and businesses that are interested in preparing us the best we can. So I have to be a bit vague, but... Uh, yeah. That's where we're at now. Uh, so your your it doesn't sound like you guys are going to um, anytime soon just issue sort of um, simple a simple guidelines or standards for what people should be wearing outside at all times or anything like that. Well, when you when you say anytime soon, uh, again we're waiting for federal gui guidance on this uh, the CDC guidance, uh, but at the same time I think as you heard in the previous question about some of the inventory, uh, the PPEs that are necessary for those on the front lines uh, to protect them. So we certainly don't want to uh, take away from their stockpile. Uh, we don't want to use uh, N95 masks, for instance, uh, that would take away uh, from those healthcare providers that, that are, they need them today. Um, so, uh, you know, I've, I've, we've thought a lot about this over the last uh, week or so, and it's um, we don't want anyone uh, to, to um, be given the false impression that this will protect them themselves uh, from, uh, from uh, contracting this virus. But it could, it could in an altruistic way, um, provide relief for someone else uh, from you spreading it to someone else. So uh, while encouraging uh, that, uh, we do not want to take away from the stockpile that we have now, especially the N95 masks. All right, thanks. All right, Sean from the Chester Telegraph. Uh, thank you. This is a question for Dr. Levine. Um, could you tell us what the definition of recovered is and how many have recovered in Vermont? That, that definition is evolving just like everything else is evolving. Um, but in terms of guidance about if you're recovered enough to, for instance, go back to work or if you're an essential job or a healthcare worker, the guidance from CDC has been seven days from the onset of your symptoms and then three days without fever or any of the associated symptoms that you had. It's a real hard number to get a good handle on because we know perhaps from the hospital level if you've been hospitalized because you were ill enough and then you became well enough to be discharged if you fit into a recovered definition. But think about all of the people who are not needing hospitalization. So it's very hard to get your handle on exactly what percentage of the population uh, that you're not aware of had a mild or moderate illness and then recovered from that illness and we're able to leave their isolation status, if you will. So it's too early for us to give you very precise statistics, unfortunately. So is there, is there a way that the state is asking people who have been identified as being infected and who are self-isolating, are they, are they reporting in that they have been three days without symptoms? 
Uh, not to my knowledge at this point in time. Okay, thank you. All right, Tim McQuiston, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor, thank you. Uh, yesterday, your uh, staff uh, hazarded a guess of when we might peak with the virus. Uh, have you thought ahead about when uh, workers you might lift at least part of the stay home uh, order? And I'm thinking of construction, uh, golf courses, They're getting a lot of comment about that, frankly. Uh, lawn, lawn mowing people even. If, if you would roll out uh, when people can get back to work in, in some order, if you thought about that, and when that might be. These are low density outdoor kind of uh, jobs, which uh, might naturally be more socially distant. Yeah, obviously, uh, we've been giving some of that some thought uh, in in preparation for uh, what's coming in the next uh, month or so. Um, and we'll, as you might have noticed, uh, when we managed our way into this uh, and took different steps to to make sure that we're protecting Vermonters, uh, we uh, we continue to do that on almost a daily basis. Uh, so we'll unwind in the same fashion, uh, and we'll pay attention to the science and data and the experts uh, that, that are coming forward to guide us. And we've done that throughout this whole uh, pandemic, uh, and we'll continue to do that throughout uh, the, the other side of this. Uh, so we'll continue uh, to, uh, to wait until we peak, uh, and then make certain that we've done so, and then we'll mitigate our way out of this as well. Uh, thank you. Galloway, Digger. And star six to unmute. Hi, all. Can you hear me okay? We can. Oh, great. Thank you. Um, I wondered how many days of N95s and PPEs the state has um, stockpiled so far. I also wanted to know how many healthcare workers have been tested positive. And uh, I also wondered, um, you know, how the state is dealing with, new, with nursing homes. Is the policy to keep COVID patients in place rather than move them to the hospital? We'll, uh, we'll go with the first uh, question, uh, and I believe, uh, Commissioner Sherling, are you on the line at this point in time? And if you're on, you might have to star six. Commissioner. Let's go to the second question. We'll go back to uh, Commissioner Sherling. Dr. Levine. I think it was the question was the number. All right, let's try. Huh? Let's try this. Can you hear me now? Yes. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, give me just a moment, Governor. I've only been on for a second uh, after being on a call with the OC managers um, to get to the PPE information in front of me. Okay. All right. We'll uh, we'll come back to you, Dr. Levine. I think the second question was the number of healthcare workers that have tested positive. And that's not a number I've memorized and have at the top of my head, so we'll have to get back to you with the exact number. I can tell you they continue to be a priority group so that the results come back as quickly as possible. Uh, but I can't give you a precise number right this second. The other, the other part of the question, Ann, can you, uh, it was about uh, nursing home facilities. Could you repeat that? Yes. Yes, it is the preference of the Department of Health to, make, to ensure that nursing home patients stay in place rather than moving them to the hospital? Uh, I'm going to interpret the way you phrased that question as uh, actually maybe prohibit them or prevent them from going to a hospital. No, we, that we, wasn't we, actually okay, what I was Okay, because we're, we're certainly it's not going to interfere. to make sure they stay in place. Yeah, no, I mean... The decision to be hospitalized really is a medical decision, and every one of the nursing home patients is under the care of a physician or a nurse practitioner. So 
if their decision was the level of illness was acute enough that hospitalization would be warranted and it was in the goals of care for that particular nursing home resident to go to a hospital setting, we would certainly want that to happen. Um, I have no, no problem with that happening. I mean, hospitals are prepared to receive COVID positive patients. Uh, so just because they're coming from a nursing home wouldn't really matter. And from the nursing but home standpoint. that's true. And but from the nursing true, home standpoint. Why are so many nursing home patients dying in place? Yeah, so I actually I've addressed this at previous press conferences. Um, there's a large number of patients, specifically because this was in reference to Burlington Health and Rehab, who had orders on their charts based on their advanced directives that were instructions to not transfer to hospital, to live out their last days in place, if you will. Um, there's also a bit of a success story at Burlington Health and Rehab, which isn't well advertised, um, and I don't want to be premature in it, but there's a cohort of patients who remained there, did not go to the hospital, were positive patients in testing, and have survived in spite of numerous comorbidities, chronic illnesses, immune suppressing conditions. So it's not necessarily even uh, when one doesn't go to the hospital, uh, a death sentence, if you will, there are a cohort of patients who have actually survived the illness, um, and I hope to hear more stories like that, to be honest. Commissioner Sherling is now available to answer the second part of your question or the third part of your question, yeah. So, and uh, relative to PPE, we measure it at the moment in, in terms of patient days. So based on an estimated uh, consumption rate daily uh, and the total quantity on hand, it's measured in patient days. So I'll give you a, just a couple of examples. In N95 respirators, we have 21,693 patient days of stock available. In face protection, uh, we have 11,795 patient days available. Uh, in gloves, 52,908, and so forth. So I, I'm sorry, that, that, that is all Greek to me. What does any of that mean? I, I, I don't understand. When you say patient days, do we ha actually have, so if we have um, 600 patients in hospitals across the state, how long does that last? I don't really understand. Um, you would divide the numbers. So let me give you just raw numbers. Uh, gloves, we have 1.9 million gloves in stock. Uh, we have uh, face protections, about 59,000 units. Uh, N95 respirators, we have 283,000 units. And how often do these things need to be changed out by staff? Is that is a medical staff? question. That's, that's a medical question. I don't have the answer to. Right, but aren't you purchasing these things based on estimates of what you'll need? As we've indicated before, we're not using estimates to purchase. We're purchasing any and all available PPE at the most rapid rate possible. So what you're saying is we have enough to get through the crisis or that is not what I'm saying. Uh, the, as we discussed with the modeling yesterday, uh, there are a variety of different trajectories that this can take based on um, folks' compliance with the, uh, the key measures that have been put in place. So if, if everything holds um, and our trajectory remains where it is today, uh, we will have plenty. If uh, folks begin congregating and uh, not paying attention to the guidance that's been given by the CDC and the executive orders. Uh, the burn rates will go up, the number of cases will go up, and we will be at risk of outstripping our supply of PPE, ventilators, and beds. Is there a better way to translate the data that you gave me originally in terms of patient days? It, it's just, it doesn't, it, it, it's meaningless to me. Is there a better way to say it? Is there a way that any can, normal person could understand it? And can we get back to you on this? We have 
several more or a dozen more reporters yeah. waiting? Can we just take I, th I think, I, yeah, I think we can simplify yeah. this, uh, and and uh, and we'll do that. I, I understand. Thank I understand you. the dilemma. So we'll, we'll I've made a note, Anne, and we'll get we'll circle back. Okay, uh, Pat Bradley, WAMC. Good morning. Um, I think my question is for uh, Dr. Levine. Good morning. How are you today? Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Levine, earlier you talked about how the rapid response team works with the facilities where we've seen the outbreaks and such. Um, in, in particular, when we talked about Birchwood Terrace and such, I know yesterday during one of his updates mayor merle weinberger talked about how he had gone back and forth with you about getting more information and more readily available information about the outbreak and when you take a look at you talking about the rapid response team working with the facilities there's a lot of people out there who have their loved ones there who don't know what's going on. So what are you doing or do you have plans in place now to really interact with the public better in real time rather than having a delay in getting the information out? You may be telling us today what happened uh, in these facilities but what about the family when it happened yesterday or the day before? How are you communicating with them? That's a great question. And, and I'm glad you're referring your question to the families of the loved ones that are there, who are the ones most concerned, obviously. Um, because, because part of our rapid response is we are embedded and working with the facility. And the facility has the responsibility quite often to communicate with their staff, with their residents, and with the families of those residents. So we are doing our best to not only educate and intervene and implement as needed, but we communicate with those in the facility so that they can provide the appropriate messaging. Uh, since we're not the caregivers for every individual who lives there. Um, so it's very important that we get those messages within the facility to be quite clear and so everyone understands the implications of what we're advising, what we're recommending that they intervene with or implement uh, all along the way. So uh, none of that uh, would come as a surprise and none of that was what the mayor was referring to. I believe he was much more referring to uh, his own knowledge and his office's knowledge of what was going on at that level. Uh, but that uh, shouldn't be construed to convey any misconceptions about what the facility is doing and how they are constantly in the loop. We actually can do nothing without the cooperation of the facility, so it would be very foolhardy for us to not be advising, educating, communicating with them at every moment. Does that answer your question? Mostly. Um, how much do HIPAA rules prevent you from getting this information publicized, uh, you know, not only to other family members, but say to, you know, whatever community leader, you know, not just Burlington this is occurring in, but to other community leaders and to the media. Yeah, so obviously HIPAA rules have to do with patient by patient, naming patients. There's really not a need to do that in public communication about these facilities. We can use much more aggregate data about the facility, talking about the number of residents who have an infection, the number potentially of healthcare workers that have an infection, uh, without naming anyone and breaking any HIPAA rules. So it's, it's easy to communicate in that way uh, without worrying about uh, being inappropriate or uh, interfering with confidentiality. And are you working to speed up the process between discovering 
an outbreak at a facility and letting not only the family members know, but the general public know that this has occurred? Yes. Short answer, yes. Long answer that you, you are aware of one specific instance that does not mean that has been the practice all along. Thank you. Wilson Ring, AP. Okay, great. Uh, finally seem to be getting up the technology here. Uh, so another follow-up question for Dr. Levine about advanced directives. You've been talking about that quite a bit. And was that just in Burlington Health and Rehabilitation? And thinking beyond that, um, given that the statistics show you have some idea of at least a percentage of the patients who are going to need uh, some sort of advanced care, um, are you able to calculate into your usage estimates patients who might not need that care because they are under advanced directives of some sort? And then the follow-up question to that is, um, is there more of an emphasis now in nursing homes and perhaps at hospitals for any COVID patient who is presenting and needs to be hospitalized? Is there more of an emphasis on those advanced directives? So we're all looking at each other because various words came through well and various didn't. So let me try to reinterpret your question and see if I'm on target. Okay. Um, what happens when I'm on a back phone? I understand. Um, basically, you're looking at, um, can we figure out the percentage of uh, older Vermonters who might be in a nursing home and might be under an advanced directive that would state no aggressive measures should be taken uh, and factor that in as we begin to look at our modeling for surge and how many uh, individuals who might not have that kind of advanced directive, but the advanced directive might be do everything you can, sh short of a heroic measure perhaps, um, and try to model our ventilator needs, ICU needs, etc. after that. So, you know, what we do know in Vermont, and we're seeing it play out, is we do have an older demographic. And we are in the top three states for age, and we have to respect that. Um, doesn't mean, though, that you know, there are 400 plus facilities that older Vermonters who aren't living at home can live in, and they're not all uh, nursing homes. And many of them are more independent senior living facilities uh, and other types where, uh, by implication, the person is less medically frail and can succeed and survive on their own. Uh, and presumably would have an advanced directive that said such. So have to be careful when we think about that because uh, many people would want to be brought to a hospital, would want to get uh, the wonderful care the hospital can provide, but would draw the line at having a ventilator and say, if it came to that, that's not what I perceive is the life I'd want to have and my family wouldn't want to see me go through that. Um, and that's very challenging for us to sort of pre-calculate. I think most of what we're doing is still modeling in a way that we're not modeling the best case scenario, but we're modeling something on the continuum towards worst case. So I'd rather do that than assume that there were abundant Vermonters who never wanted to see a hospital or ICU or ventilator and err on the side of making sure we can provide enough for the population rather than on the other side. The other part of that is that there are, as the national and worldwide experience continues to expand, if you say that most of the people who are going to be in the hospital are older because they're the ones that are most vulnerable to this virus in its most severe form, it turns out that the larger the number of people that are getting the virus in your particular state, there will be 20% of those that may be in a demographic you weren't anticipating. They may be below age 50, even younger than that. Um, and if your state is large enough in terms of numbers, 20% can be a large number, absolutely, of people. 
So we have to, again, do our surge planning considering factors like that as well. So without hearing every word you said, did I answer enough? Uh, pretty much. The, the only, yes, that was the first part of the question. The other part is, do you know, has it changed or placed more of an emphasis on uh, patients who are entering the hospital or a nursing home to make sure their advanced directives are in order? That's been, uh, forgetting about COVID, that's been a, uh, not, I would, I would call it even more than a trend. That's been practice uh, for quite some time now, and it's actually a performance quality indicator uh, for patients who enter hospitals quite often. Uh, and when uh, outpatient care is assessed, uh, the percent of patients who are lacking an advanced directive is one of those metrics that we in the physician world have to uh, report and adhere to and try to improve on. So even without COVID, all of that was uh, underway, uh, ongoing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Brittany from Local 22. Um, my question is about um, hospital beds. And with the predictions that were put out yesterday, uh, do we think Vermont is going to have enough hospital beds or are the hospitals about to be overwhelmed? I'm going to let uh, Commissioner Pichek answer that question. Uh, thank you, Governor Mike Pichek from the Department of Financial Regulation. So, Brittany, um, as we talked about yesterday, our modeling indicates that uh, Vermont uh, is on a better than our likely trajectory from just a week ago. Uh, under that likely trajectory, we were we did have enough hospital bed resources to care for all those uh, who would need a hospital bed. Um, it's important, though, to remember that those numbers can change, and they can change for the worst or for the better, uh, and that's why it's so critical for people to continue to social distance, to double down on it, uh, because the worst is still ahead of us, even though we have the glimmer of hope that we talked about yesterday. Thank you. Courtney Landon, seven days. Hi, Governor. Uh, just a question about um, masks specifically. Are you recommending that essential workers, such as grocery store clerks, wear masks at work? Um, and then I'm doing a twofer here. Do you also expect to extend orders on um, staying at home and closing bars and restaurants? Thank you. Yeah, uh, I'm going to answer the second part of that uh, first. Um, you can expect uh, that there will be an extension of the uh, initial order and that'll be coming in the next uh, two or three days and yes so we'll extend uh, for a period of time uh, and then update as necessary uh, based on the science and the data that we receive and the advice of of the experts uh, and watching uh, again the the uh, the modeling that we did and that we presented yesterday is so important to us to make sure that we're not exceeding our our um, hospital capacity or our healthcare capacity and staying underneath that line and then we'll manage our way out of this um, so uh, the first part uh, with the mass i'm going to let uh, dr levine uh, stress that again so if and when guidance comes out from the federal government or ourselves it's going to be much more of a blanket policy recommended to all people so we won't have to single out a particular work group like a grocery store worker. But I want to, again, emphasize what you've heard abundantly today about the social distancing is still the policy. And what the governor said that um, you should view this as an altruistic policy. So you may think that the grocery store worker is being protected by wearing the mask, but it's actually you being protected from them. Uh, and the reason for wearing the mask or the facial covering is to protect others around you uh, in case you are in that pre-symptomatic infectious phase. Would you personally recommend that they wear them anyway? Like, and not just, you know, grocery clerks, but others? I'm, I'm going to, I'll start and then I'll let Dr. Levine finish. Uh, again, if this uh, 
if this, this makes you feel more at ease, uh, more comfortable, uh, and you want to do something to protect others, uh, please do so. Uh, but don't use the N95 mask. Don't take away from the frontline healthcare providers uh, at this point in time. Um, and if you, uh, but just be aware uh, that this isn't uh, this isn't the answer uh, in terms of of, uh, of going out uh, and uh, and then uh, integrating with others and and becoming social again. Uh, we don't want people uh, to, to move around. We want people to stay at home. So uh, we don't want to give any false a sense of security in this way, uh, but for those uh, who are comforted by that, and again, uh, to protect others, uh, they should do so. Thank you. Pam Davis, star six to unmute. Uh, my question is, um, I'm not sure you should answer it, is whether the uh, list of uh, uh, medical resources in Vermont have included, available to Vermont, is, have included the facilities available at Dartmouth. That's an almost 500 bed hospital. It's got a, it's got a lot of stuff. It's got it has, it, as much as, or nearly as much as UVM has. Uh, I just wonder about whether that, those, those, uh, the Dartmouth numbers are in the total numbers that get reported. And the follow-up question would be whether you can say, uh, wh whether you can say that the pattern of, pattern of hospitalization already, has it begun to, be has it tended to focus on bigger hospitals or are, you, are we getting hospitalization in community access, uh, critical access hospitals? of which there are eight in the state. They will only have 25 beds, and they will have much less resource, medical resources. Um, I think I'm going to, maybe, is Secretary Smith on the, uh, on the line? I am, Governor, and I'll take the first part of that question, if you don't mind. Ham, the, uh, we have not included Dartmouth into those numbers. Obviously, Dartmouth is a resource that we can turn to if we have to. The reason we haven't included Dartmouth is because New Hampshire is probably doing the same exercise that we are doing right now and looking at available beds. And we didn't want to double count given the fact that New Hampshire is looking uh, and doing the same, uh, same exercise as we are. Uh, so Dartmouth isn't in that figure, but at the same time, Dartmouth, um, we're coordinating with Dartmouth in all of these exercises just to make sure that they're aware of what we're doing and if, if possible, a resource for Vermonters as we plan. I'll, uh, I'll, Dr. Levine, can you do the second part of that question? Because I'm not sure if I have an answer to that. I'm going to let uh, Commissioner Pichak answer uh, some part of that. And then uh, if we have to, we'll go to Dr. Levine. So, Ham, um, on the first part of your question, as Secretary Smith alluded to, 40% uh, of those that get treatment at Dartmouth are Vermonters. Uh, so we are aware of those numbers, but as the Secretary alluded to, they're not included in our modeling numbers. So those would be in addition to and above the numbers that we reported and are included in our modeling yesterday. But just to follow up that a little bit, I, the, I, don't, I, don't, I think I missed the first thing that you said, but 40% of Dartmouth traffic is, is Vermonters day in and day out. And it's going to be an interesting political question whether um, if, we, if the surge puts a lot of pressure on the system, we come up close, coming up from the south, coming up close to that capacity line, uh, whether the east side of the uh, Vermont is on the east side, the east of the Green Mountains sort of the east coast of Vermont, whether they will be able, especially on hard cases, really dangerously ill cases, whether they'll be able to get a piece of that Dartmouth capacity. So I think That's again... my opinion, sorry. Yeah, so I think again... It's no, a, like... Oh, go ahead, Mike. No, like I said, Ham, we, we, are, we recognize the capacity that is there, but at the same time, we want to be very cautious not to double count uh that when we're when we're doing our estimate on available beds so uh, we understand what you're saying we understand the capacity that is there but at the same time we want to make darn sure that we are are counting the beds that we know are available thank you that answer all of your questions Ham. 
Yeah, I, I, I just, yeah, this is just a suggestion. One of the things I think that would help the, the, keep the public to be able to follow the track, not just the, the overall track of this, but the more detailed track. And, and one way to do that would be to simply list every day the number of patients that are hospitalized for COVID in each hospital service area, there's 14 of them, and they, they, they really much correspond to every county. And the experience in um, in east, in you know, northeastern Vermont, is the density there is a half of what it is in Chittenden County. So you would really be able to see, I think, a lot better if you just took the state map and you put the number of people in a hospital for COVID by hospital service area. That's just an idea. Thank you. And and we are currently. Uh, able on a daily basis to know who in Vermont is hospitalized for COVID uh, and by hospital. As you would imagine, with the highest population density being in the northwestern part of the state, that hospital would show more cases on a daily basis. But there have been cases in some of the critical access hospitals you referred to. All right, we're gonna to move to Raymond Torres, Channel 7. Raymond? Hi, um, hi there. Uh, I just had a question on whether there was any plans in place in case the virus breaks out in inmate populations across the state. Um. Can you just repeat that again? Inmate populations. I think Secretary Smith has answered this question quite a bit. Um, maybe Secretary Smith, you want to answer that again? Give it again. Sure. Um, this, I, this has been a question that uh, come up uh, continually. Uh, we put uh, preventive measures into place, including uh, quarantine for new uh, prisoners that uh, new inmates that are coming into our correctional facility. We also have limited uh, visitation to video only. Uh, all workers are screened for temperatures as we uh, move forward. But also, if we do have a case and, of, uh, of COVID-19 within our prison system, we do have negative pressure rooms in, our, in, our, in a couple of our facilities where, the, where a person will be quarantined uh, as they as they recover from this. Secondly, we have an overflow or a surge capacity that we have um, developed in the St. Johnsbury Work Camp facility for those COVID-19 um, inmates that may not require hospitalization or a higher level of uh, care where they can recover as well. So. There has been quite a bit of planning that is going on, more on the preventive side to make sure that we really are careful on who's coming into our facilities and and when they're coming into our facilities. And then once they're in, monitoring uh, those, those various, um, whether they're employees or uh, inmates in our facilities. So that's what's happening. So, uh, is the surge capacity places planned in St. John's Ferry? Is that for healthy inmates, or is that planned for only healthy inmates, or is the other going to be preventative tests at those locations too? The, that is surge capacity. So, if there are inmates who are COVID pot, COVID nineteen positive, um, and don't don't need hospitalization that's where they will be quarantined is in uh, the St. John's Ferry work camp facility. Okay. All right, Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes, good morning, thank you. Um, this is a little bit off thing, but what is being done for the parents who have students who are home now who have an IEP program? And is the state doing anything to monitor the kids who might become, who might come from a dysfunctional family or come from a troubled family to make sure those individuals are safe? Chris, we don't have Secretary French on today. No AOE is working on guidance on, on these issues, which we could shoot over to you or connect Secretary French to you. Okay, I'd like that. Thank you. Okay, great. All right, Alan from the Vermont Standard.
Allen Vermont Standard. All right, Dana from the Caledonia Record. Dana, star six to unmute. Uh, good afternoon, this is uh, Dana. Uh, just a, a question, I'm not sure who to direct it to, but uh, uh, among the identified locations to receive patients uh, in the event of, of a surge of cases, the closest to the Northeast Kingdom uh, that's been identified is Barry. I'm just wondering if there are any sites uh, in the kingdom that are being contemplated. And then a follow-up question for Secretary Smith. Uh, you mentioned the St. John's Marie facility as search for inmates. Um, who may have tested positive for COVID-19 uh, but do not need to be hospitalized. So my question there is, are there currently people uh, in that condition at the St. Jay facility? Um, I'm going to ask uh, Commissioner Sherman me... to answer part of that. But go ahead, uh, Secretary Smith. Yeah, to, um, as of this morning, we have no confirmed uh, positive cases of COVID-19 within our prison population. We've had I believe uh, two uh, staff members that have tested positive, but as of today, so no, the answer is no. Uh, there is no COVID-19 uh, uh, inmate at the uh, St. John's Ferry facility. In terms of uh, in terms of surge capacity, remember the first line of defense of surge capacity is within our current uh, hospital hospital system. You have two hospitals up there in the Northeast Kingdom that are now, um, I've asked them to surge their capacity to take more patients, especially ICU and those types of uh, operations up into their hospital. So uh, we also have mobile units that Michael Sherling will probably talk about that we can deploy depending on uh, the need in, in that area. We're trying to stay as flexible as possible with our surge so that we can we can react uh, quickly in the case we need uh, mobility in that region, uh, Michael. Sure, uh, Secretary. I think you covered uh, it pretty well. Uh, three, uh, really four levels: internal hospital surge capacity, taking on additional patients internal to their walls. Uh, a number of state-run uh, surge sites that are hospital-specific that have been set up in Burlington, Barry, and St. Albans already two regional sites that are in progress, and then the ability to pivot assets to deploy them as necessary using these mobile trailers uh, as necessary. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Joe Barton Chronicle. Joe Barton Chronicle, star six to unmute. All right, Patricia from the Bennington Banner. Patricia, I believe you're unmuted. Patricia. All right, Liam from VPR. Hi, uh, this is a question for uh, Commissioner Levine. Um, a week ago, Hello, you please. said the health department. Patricia, please stand by. Go ahead, Liam. Um, thanks. Yeah, a week ago, Commissioner said that uh, the health department was expanding its testing um, in part because it had enough test kits to do so. And I was wondering what the state's supply of kits is right now, if you've been able to sort of replenish them at all. and how much longer you'd be planning to do that expanded testing um, if you have the capacity for it? Sure. <clears throat> so depending on uh, what scenario we choose, it's kind of like modeling for surge. Um, depending on the level of testing on a given day, we have varying degrees of sustaining this operation at this intensity. But suffice it to say, um, well over 10 days, if not double or triple that. We've had a second analyzer come online at the health department laboratory, which actually has a f 
a uh, larger capacity for testing than the one that we've been using all along, so we would be able to do both of those together. We still have capacity at the Mayo Clinic, and the uh, UVM Medical Center is in the process of validating its own test and trying to secure the reagents it would need for that test, which would provide even further capacity. So I have to be vague, like any modeling uh, is, and, and telling you that we certainly have uh, well over a week or 10 days, and, and maybe even uh, double or triple that, depending on uh, how much we need. So we're going to continue this level of testing uh, into the foreseeable future, because it's very, very important uh, as part of a containment strategy, as well as for our surveillance and understanding how we're doing with all of the mitigation interventions like social distancing that have been put into place. I mean, to that end, uh, Commissioner, can you give me a specific example of how in the week or so that you have been doing this expanded testing that you've shifted your strategy of containment or surveillance in response to this higher number of tests that you're doing? Yeah, so part of that strategy um, allows you to um, certainly advise those who test positive to isolate, but then to do all of the appropriate contact tracing uh, with the help of that individual uh, so that you can appropriately recommend quarantine for those who are most likely to uh, be in contact and perhaps get infected. So part of the strategy is to expand our workforce in contact tracing. And we have abundant members of the Department of Public Safety, uh, local police departments, et cetera, that we've been training all week uh, in the science and art of contact tracing to augment our workforce so that if the increased level of testing produces an increased number of cases, uh, we can do the appropriate thing case by case because we, <clears throat> we will have manpower to do that. Is that clear? Yeah, uh, thanks, Commissioner. Patricia, are you still on? All right, last call, Patricia. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, gosh, but I can't hear you. Are you there? We, yes. can, we can hear you. Huh? Oh, okay, thank you. My, my phone volume was turned down again. Okay, sorry to take so long with that. Um, I guess I have two, but one of them is a yes or no question, so I'm hoping I might be able to squeeze by. Secretary Moore, um, should individuals wear a mask in outdoor recreation or only when they're in enclosed spaces with other individuals, or anyone who's able to answer that question? Um, I think the, <clears throat> excuse me, I think the question probably is best put to Dr. Levine and they, with the answer he's already offered, which is we're awaiting the CDC guidance. Um, and again, can't okay. emphasize enough the importance of social distancing, whether it's in an indoor or outdoor environment. I, we've seen evidence that it's really tempting for folks to congregate outside. I think probably under the assumption there's a lot of air um, and a lot of room. But the fact of the matter is if you're standing close to one another, it, it really doesn't matter if you're inside or out. Um, you need to observe those minimal physical separations. That makes sense. And along with, um, I know Dr. Levine, um, if you're still on, you mentioned, I believe it was yesterday, um, that. If I understand you correctly, you do anticipate a second round of infections. I believe you said the intermediate kind of prediction was around three months after the peak. If I understand that correctly, there would be another wave. And I'm wondering if, in fact, that's accurate, um, Governor or uh, Dr. Levine or anyone really, how do you guys anticipate keeping the economy functioning here in Vermont with that potential need, uh, or rather anticipated need, to have to implement at least some social distancing measures again in the future after they're initially relaxed. Yeah, again, you know, so much is going to be dependent on what happens on a, on a national level as well, and, uh, mm -hmm. and certainly worldwide. We're learning new, there's new uh, um, treatment uh, being contemplated every day. Um, there's even the possibility of, of other measures being taken uh, that will give us guidance as we get through this, uh, because this is so new. Uh, this is such a new uh, virus uh, that we don't have a playbook, so we don't know what to expect. And, and uh, for us to say uh, that uh, once this wave is over, uh, that, uh, that we'll go back to normal, 
would be disingenuous. Uh, we're going to have to be con constantly uh, monitoring and making sure that we make corrections as, as best we can uh, based on the science, based on the information we're receiving. So um, we may be in for a bit of a bumpy road over the next uh, year or two, but I, I remember after 9-11, all the different things we learned uh, from, from that experience, as well as after Irene, and uh, we, uh, we took, uh, took things in and we did things differently. And we'll be doing the same uh, as we uh, work our way out of this one. So um, I haven't got a, a good answer for you at this point other than to say uh, this will be uh, long term. Uh, we're going to have to monitor uh, this for quite some time. Sure, brief question here. Have any enforcement actions been taken in regard to violating any of the governor's orders? Um, so we know that, you know, state police did visit some lodging establishments, things like that, but have any, you know, fines been issued? Have any penalties been put out? That sort of thing. Yeah, not uh, that I am aware of, but I'm going to ask uh, Commissioner Sherling if he's aware of any. No, not aware of any, um, and I believe that uh, with full visibility to what's going on on the ground. All right, thank you. Thanks, Kat. Greg? All right, thanks, guys. Um, I think this is for Dr. Levine. So uh, hospitals have been, have been working to increase their capacities, um, but obviously they're not designed for the numbers that you're anticipating. So what are hospitals doing? What, what are they... Uh, what are they giving up to accommodate larger numbers? <clears throat> In the short term, according to the governor's order, they're giving up elective surgeries. Um, things that would occur in a hospital in their routine way of doing business, but that during this emergency aren't going to occur. So that's in the short term. In the long term, um, some of them will be adapting some of their facilities to a more intensively ill population and perhaps expanding the number of rooms they have that could be considered to deliver an intensive level of care. But I think the ultimate part of the surge, we are thinking that many of the sites that we've set up will accommodate, if you will, the less ill or perhaps those who still have to be hospitalized but they don't happen to have COVID. You know, we've talked often about the fact people still get illnesses uh, in the era of COVID. Uh, and the same kind of illnesses that would have hospitalized somebody with heart disease or diabetes or cancer are still going to hospitalize them. So can some of those admissions be diverted to these other facilities, enabling the hospital to still deliver that high level of intensive care that might be needed for the COVID population. So just a little follow up. Uh, obviously, um, you have surge units that are opening up in secondary locations, but hospitals are increasing the number of beds as well, correct? Many of them? Or am I, am I wrong with that information? Um, I'm not sure Secretary that Smith, they're you increasing the beds necessarily. It was, are hospitals I increasing as well as the surge site locations? Yes. Yeah, they, we're asking hospitals to increase their surge capacity. We're in, we're asking them to uh, staff up to uh, a surge capacity that uh, uh, will be the first line of defense. The the other areas that we're talking about are if we exceed that surge capacity of the hospital. So right now, they we have asked them to increase their surge capacity. Okay. All right, that's everybody. Um, for those of you, Anne Galloway and Chris Roy, who I said I would follow up with afterwards, I've made note of that. Okay, thank you all very much for tuning in, and we'll see you back here on Monday.